Hello and welcome to the history of Star Trek. On today's episode, we'll be covering Professor Moriarty, and here we go. Moriarty's creation was an unintentional and the direct result of a discussion between Data, LaForge, and Dr. Catherine Pulaski about Data's ability to solve problems like Sherlock Holmes would. Dr. Pulaski contended that Data could solve these problems because he had memorized all of Sherlock Holmes' novels, but would not be able to solve a new Sherlock Holmes-based novel. When LaForge suggested creating a mystery where Data's solving abilities could be tested, Pulaski told him Data would fail, and agreed to take part in it. A short time after the mystery had begun, Data solved it with little effort. Whereupon Pulaski accused Data of fraud, as she felt it was not an original mystery but a variation on a theme. During this discussion, they were already watched by Moriarty. LaForge then decided to let the computer create an opponent for Data, and told it to create an adversary with the ability to defeat Data, not just Sherlock Holmes. After this command was given, the bridge registered a power surge. While the Moriarty hologram appeared dazzled, when asked by a female companion about his condition, he replied he felt like a new man. Since Moriarty had heard the commands used by LaForge, he made the arch appear himself and inquired about his purpose. He was informed that it was used for entering computer commands. He resolved to gather more information and decided to follow the three officers. After some time, Moriarty decided to abduct the woman of the group, Dr. Pulaski and he hid her in an abandoned warehouse. As time went by, Moriarty became more aware of his own consciousness, seeing strange images inside his head that he could not name. Because clear signs were left behind when Dr. Pulaski was abducted, Moriarty was soon found by LaForge and Data. Moriarty welcomed them as Holmes and Watson, and also as not being Holmes and Watson. He told them they both looked familiar to him, but then again not so familiar. He informed them that the strange realities were part of his consciousness, and that he was aware of an oracle greater than Delphi, named Computer. After he summoned the Arch, he gave to stun Data a drawing he had made, a drawing of the USS Enterprise D, and he told them he knew it was a vessel of some kind, and that he and they were aboard it. Data and LaForge immediately left the holodeck and took the image to Captain Picard. Meanwhile, Moriarty was courteous to the captive Dr. Pulaski, enjoying her company and discourse. He offered her tea and scones while he questioned her, and told her that he already knew who Picard was. Although Pulaski said she had never heard of him, Moriarty showed her machinery that he had built, which he could use to control the Enterprise. He showed this same machinery to Picard, who entered the Hollow program with Data and LaForge. Moriarty told Data that this was about more than just ending a holodeck adventure, and he told Picard that he only wanted to exist. Moriarty made clear to Picard that he was well aware of his surroundings, and shook the Enterprise by means of his self-made machinery. When Moriarty asked Picard if he could leave the holodeck, Picard informed him of the limitations of the holodeck and that the matter and energy created by the holodeck could not exist outside of it. Unpersuaded, Moriarty argued that he found himself alive, and as such had a right to exist. He used Data as an argument. Data, after all, was a machine and yet considered alive. Moriarty continued to press his case and told Picard that he didn't want to die, who replied that he did not want to kill him. After Moriarty said goodbye to Dr. Pulaski, he summoned the Arch and returned the holodeck controls to the main computer, and put his fate in Captain Picard's hands. Moriarty knew the Enterprise had a vast library, and Picard told him that they would use it to save his program, and that they would continue to try to find a way for him to exist outside the holodeck. The program was saved and stored in the ship's protected memory. In 2369, four years after Moriarty's program was stored, Data and LaForge were again running a Sherlock Holmes hollow novel when they found some discrepancies and asked Lieutenant Reginald Barclay to check the program and the holodeck. When Barclay found the protected memory, he unlocked it and ran the program it contained. Moriarty appeared and asked Barclay if Captain Picard was still in command of the Enterprise. A confused Barclay listened as Moriarty explained who and where he was, and asked Barclay if Picard had found a way to enable him to leave the holodeck. Barclay responded that Moriarty could still only exist inside the holodeck. Surprisingly, it seemed that Moriarty was aware of the passing of time while he was stored in protected memory. 
Moriarty asked how long it had been, remarking that it had seemed longer than four years, and had asked to speak with Captain Picard. When he was told by Barclay that he had to store him in memory again, Moriarty appeared to cooperate, but in fact remained active after Barclay left the holodeck. Moriarty didn't know if Picard would help him this time and devised a ruse. He met Picard in Holmes' room at 221 B Baker Street. Moriarty did not believe Picard when he told him he had not been forgotten and that Starfleet's finest scientists had not found a way to allow him to leave the holodeck. He told Picard that it was a matter of willpower, and when Picard summoned the holodeck exit, Moriarty walked through it before anyone realized what he had done. A stunned Picard and Data walked up to him and could not understand how this was possible. Moriarty was told by Picard that he needed to be examined, and he was taken to Dr. Beverly Crusher, who had found nothing wrong with him other than unusual DNA, and he was human. The newly liberated Moriarty was given a tour of the Enterprise by Captain Picard, and he looked at the stars when they entered 10 forward. When Picard expressed concerns about his criminal behavior his character was known for, Moriarty told him that was all fictional and had nothing to do with real life. Moriarty asked Picard if the Countess Regina, the love of his life, could also be brought off the holodeck like himself. Picard told the professor that he did not understand why Moriarty could leave the holodeck and had no idea how to replicate that feat. Despite Picard's assurances that Barclay and Data would investigate the possibility of bringing the Countess off the holodeck, Moriarty decided to force the issue and took control of the Enterprise. Unknown to Picard, Moriarty had already changed the command codes into his own, so he could override every command entered. The situation was made more critical by the impending collision of two planets in the Deltaran system, which the Enterprise had been monitoring. After making his demands, Moriarty returned to Baker Street, where he found the Countess together with Barclay, who placed pattern enhancers around a chair to test whether they could use the transporter to beam something off the holodeck into the real world. The attempt failed, but it gave Data the clue he needed to realize how Moriarty had left the holodeck. He had instead created a holographic representation of the ship, with Picard, Data, and Barclay, the only people who had been in the holodeck when he created this illusion. Unaware of Picard's discovery of his deception, Moriarty contacted Commander Riker on the bridge and asked about the progress in getting him off the holodeck. When Riker replied that they had made no progress, Moriarty informed him of the experiment with the transporter and reminded Riker that he had nothing to lose by allowing the Enterprise to be destroyed by the planetary collision. When Moriarty returned to Baker Street, he was informed by the Countess that Picard had told her that it might be possible to bring them off the holodeck by uncoupling the Heisenberg compensators before transport. Moriarty asked her if she had heard that correctly, and when it was confirmed, he grinned. She told him that before Picard could try this, however, he wanted control of his ship back. Moriarty summoned the Arch and told Commander Riker about Picard's plan. Moriarty and the Countess stood between the active pattern enhancers to be beamed off the holodeck. After the transport, they met Commander Riker and Moriarty told him that he would only return command codes when he and the Countess were off the Enterprise, and he demanded a shuttle. Riker reluctantly agreed. Moriarty entered the shuttle together with his beloved Countess, and Riker suggested they head for Melus too, as the range of the shuttle was not unlimited. When the shuttle departed the Enterprise shuttle bay, Moriarty released the command codes to the Enterprise's main computer. When the Countess asked him if one day they would return to Earth, he assured her that they would. Unknown to Moriarty, Data and Picard had created a program within the program allowing Moriarty to believe that he had departed the holodeck despite actually remaining within it. Picard and Data then ended the simulation the moment the command lockouts were removed, and left the holodeck a few minutes later. Moriarty and the Countess Regina would spend the rest of their lives inside the memory module, unaware of their situation, for as far as they were concerned, they had left the Enterprise to live their lives in the real world. Hey, thank you for watching the history of Star Trek. Have a great day. Bye-bye.